The History of North America podcast is a sweeping historical saga of the United States, Canada, and Mexico, from their deep origins to our present epoch. Join me, Mark Vinette, on this exciting, fascinating, epic journey through time, focusing on the compelling, wonderful, and tragic stories of North America's inhabitants, heroes, villains, leaders, environment, and geography. The History of North America podcast series is an incredible historical adventure that chronicles the thrilling, action-packed tale of a continent. I invite you to come along for the ride. In late 986, upon seizing the reins of the Kingdom of Denmark from his father's cold hands, it looked as if Spain Forkbeard was destined to have all of Scandinavia at his feet. However, despite showing bravery, ferocious skill as a warrior and military leader, alongside a savvy ability to rule, the fortunes of the following years were not kind to this young Viking king. Granted, some of this was self-inflicted, lacking in preparation and unaware of the shifting sands beneath his feet. Harsh lessons for now that would serve him well during his later years. Nine years since taking power, things would start to unravel rather quickly. He had lost practically everything, all his domains, with the prospect of recovering them looking bleak indeed. The Kingdom of Denmark had been usurped while he was abroad. His forces had failed in their initial attempt to regain Norway, and in the meanwhile, another, more powerful Viking warrior, with a better claim to these lands, would soon take it instead. The royal houses of competing Viking nations, namely Sweden and Norway, were on the brink of uniting their families, which would have formed a devastating alliance that would have eventually ended any chance of a resurgence on his part. All of this colluding into a dire situation for Forkbeard, with no secure home base, meaning that his coronation vow of conquering the whole of England seemed more unlikely than ever, nothing more than a pipe dream. As the dust settled in early 995, all he was left with was a small army and a fleet of longships somewhere on the English coast. The situation could have been worse for certain, but it was a far cry from the mountain he had been sitting on. It seems that the fates then decided to conspire instead handing him some pieces of luck. Events that, in themselves, would have yielded nothing unless he pounced on them with tenacity and squeezed every last drop of advantage out of them, alluding to the saying, luck is what you make of it, relying on one's skill and ability, your perseverance to capitalize on an opportunity, rather than just relying on the luck itself. Or better yet, a piece of Viking knowledge from the saga of Olaf Haraldsson, luck accompanies wisdom. Therefore, lucky breaks with the wisdom to see these opportunities for what they are and cultivate them into distinct advantages. Just when everything appeared darkest, two prime instances of luck lighted the path forward for Forkbeard, handing him opportunities that he would build upon allowing him to dig himself out of that hole that he had found himself in to become the preeminent Scandinavian king in the region, clearing the path to begin the attempt on a more audacious summit to be traversed. Welcome to the Warlords of History podcast. I'm your host, Mark Pimenta. Episode 9 and the second exploring the lifetime, motivations, and actions of a prolific Viking warlord by the name of Svein Forkbeard. If you haven't had the chance yet, you may want to start with Episode 8, wherein we more fully explore the turbulent environment and events surrounding Forkbeard's early days, culminating in his rise to power at the expense of his father. But here's a short summary to help put things in perspective or refresh your memory as to where we left things off. In episode 8, we covered the instability facing the Kingdom of Denmark in the 960s. Although newly unified under Forkbeard's father, 
King Harald Bluetooth, the Danish realms remain scarred with division and internal factionalism, in no small part attributed to powerful external influences, including the threatening glares of the Holy Roman Empire. Consequently, to placate the juggernaut empire, Bluetooth ushered in the religious conversion of the Danish inhabitants to Christianity, clashing with the Norse gods and their core belief systems, deeply unsettling to the populace, and which was not being well received. Another impact of the Holy Roman Empire sword rattling was that this spurred Bluetooth's fortification building frenzy, adding economic burdens to key Danish regional leaders that were already questioning the departure from the old belief systems. Under the surface of these events, it was the strained relationship between father and son that would be the trigger, in time widening the deep internal divide which would eventually boil over into a civil war, featuring Forkbeard, backed by the influential Palnatoke, his foster father and founder of the elite Yams Vikings, working together to leverage those disaffected with Bluetooth's rule to raise a rebellion and launch an attack on his father on the cold waters of the Isafjord in 986, resulting in Bluetooth's death and Forkbeard being proclaimed as the king of Denmark. King Svein Forkbeard, now in the driver's seat during the early years of his reign, initially experiences a setback as his forces are defeated in trying to regain Norway, but internally does quite well finding a good balance between supporting Christianity and tolerating the Norse religion, thereby keeping external power satisfied, and internally by making a much more comfortable approach to Christian conversion. In particular, by casting the politically-minded German clergy out, replacing them with English-born missionaries of Danish ancestry, which came with the added benefit of asserting Danish sovereignty in the political landscape. When we last left things off in episode 8, it was the year 990, and for the 30-year-old Forkbeard, just over three years into his reign, things were overall going pretty good. Not great, but not terrible although his initial years had been marred by the failed attempt to retake Norway from Hakon Sigurdsson, everything was relatively stable within Denmark. However, unforeseen by the new Viking monarch, all was on the edge for taking a definitive turn for the worse. Much more worse, with Forkbeard at the risk of the rug being pulled out right from under him, losing everything that he had fought for his entire kingdom, as some historical accounts have ventured, under the sword of another mighty Viking king. But we'll get back to that shortly. For now, in 990, from his vantage point on the Danish throne, in order to further stabilize his country amongst the swirling influences surrounding his kingdom, the more immediate issue pressing to Forkbeard was securing financial injections to fund his upcoming endeavors which were essentially extensions of his father's policies, including extensive building projects such as churches and monuments, demonstrating his acceptance of Christianity to keep the Holy Roman Empire satisfied, and the construction of defensive fortifications to have a chance of defending against any incursions, particularly should the Holy Roman Emperor decide to pull a trigger on conflict anyway and lastly, building up resources to make another attempt on reclaiming Norway. But wisely, unlike his father, not wanting to place any of the financial burden of all these projects on the regional Danish chieftains and clans, thereby avoiding one of the key pitfalls that had resulted in the loss of confidence in his father's rule. Although, as mentioned, one big obstacle to this plan remained, money in that Forkbeard did not nearly have enough funds to support all these ventures. I'm sure it comes as no surprise to you at all that the preferred method for a powerful Viking leader to obtain a quick capital injection at that time was to, of course, assemble a fleet of longships filled with an army of ruthless Viking warriors to land upon the shores and sail up the rivers of foreign lands to ravage, burn, and plunder taking valuables by force. Now, quick side note for clarity's sake is that what was typical in terms of raiding parties is a subject of great debate. 
and it gets rather complicated when you factor in that there were several different types of Viking longships with differing load capacities, compounded by the idea that it also depended on the distance that they were traveling and what the objective was. For example, raiding versus naval warfare would have required ample space to be left for treasures acquired. And a good middle of the road estimate for a meaningful raiding party at the time would have been in the realm of 3,000 troops and about 50 longships, assuming 60 men per ship. In the spring of 991, King Svein Forkbeard, accompanied by such a force of battle-hardened and fiercely loyal men, set sail for England. In full transparency, this initial raid is not well documented. However, it appears that he concentrated his plundering on the southernmost coast of England, at that time part of what was known as the Kingdom of Wessex. Another notable feature of these events is that this is the first instance of Forkbeard acting alone, as the sole commander of his troops leading them from the front and distinguishing himself during these invasions, increasingly showcasing his ability and intelligence as a more than capable military commander, which stands in stark contrast to some historical accounts, namely the bad press given to him by Adam of Bremen, which we covered back in episode 8. Whereas in the sad eyes of his unfortunate English victims, witnessing these events firsthand the hallmark of Forkbeard's methods was a horror show of killing and pillaging without restraint, amassing vast sums of riches in the process. Once his longships were laden with the riches he had seized, towards the end of the raiding season in the autumn, he then returned to Denmark, during which he immediately began putting his pilfered English coins to use within his domains, commissioning churches and fortifications to be constructed throughout Denmark. But it wasn't just one round of raiding that he was looking to do, because aside from the regular Viking way of extracting funds, the English crown had recently set a precedent of paying out these Nordic invaders in a big way. 991 was a tough year for the English in terms of Viking raids, because Forkbeard wasn't the only one in the area. In fact, England at this time was seeing another renewed wave of Nordic raiders coming into their lands and despoiling it. Notably, another and larger Viking fleet that had descended upon the southeastern coast of England, looting at will, culminating in the Battle of Maldon, which occurred in August 991 at the River Blackwater in modern Essex, England. Not only did this result in a decisive Viking victory over the English defenders, but also led to the young King Æthelred paying out a tidy sum to the Vikings to leave their lands. 10,000 pounds of silver, a type of payment that would become known as Danegeld. Now, you might be wondering, wait, won't this create a bigger problem for the English and possibly even encourage or incentivize more Viking attacks? If so, it is unfortunate that King Æthelred, also named Æthelred the Unready or Ill-Advised, didn't have you there as an advisor. Because while this payment of Danegeld did indeed result in this group leaving the English shores, this policy of payout to invaders would in fact have the opposite effect it espoused to achieve. In addition to this, with the English seeing various groups of Norsemen beset them on the coasts all along England, spreading their ability thin to deal with such incursions, it had been relatively easy pickings for Forkbeard to secure vast amounts of treasure encouraging him to continue these surprise attacks. Plus, there were new stakes added into the betting pool now, Danegeld. In the spring of 992, Forkbeard, salivating at the prospect of another windfall of riches, again at the head of another fleet, set sail towards England. However, his intention and strategy had changed a little bit from the previous year, and he intended to stay in the vicinity of the British Isles for even longer than in the prior year, despoiling up and down the English coastlines until his hulls were full or until Dangeld was paid out to him. And an underlying assumption that I have is that he may have also been using this time to learn more and more about England, helping to flush out his strategy for eventually conquering it for himself. 
but evidently reaching for too much too soon. Remember when I mentioned at the beginning of this episode that things are going to get worse for Forkbeard? Well, here we go, and it's a biggie. The main problem with this change in his fundraising strategy, and certainly a poor calculation on his part, is that with Forkbeard away from his lands in Denmark for a prolonged period of time, his absence left open the perfect opportunity for another to come in and usurp his kingdom, queuing the entry of King Eric of Sweden, also known as Eric the Victorious. This was a misstep on Forkbeard's part, believing that his kingdom was adequately insulated, especially since he was still a relatively new leader and had left powerful enemies at his back in Denmark that had been ardent supporters of his father, that he had obviously ruffled the feathers of upon taking his father's kingdom by force. Forkbeard hadn't done a good enough job of clearing the path and placating these regional leaders who were on the hunt for the right opportunity to cast him down. And there were external enemies too, regional German leaders to the south of the Jutland border, still reeling from Forkbeard's treatment over the German clergy, exiling them from his lands. For example, when King Eric of Sweden was in the background, cobbling together an alliance to conquer Denmark, apparently part of the deal in securing regional German assistance was agreeing to be baptized himself, and reopening the Danish borders to the German church. All of this being prologue to the Swedish king's launch of the invasion of Denmark, while Forkbeard was far off raiding and scouring the English coastlands for plunder. Eric himself raised a large army, and with the help of Danish and German allies, over a series of sea and land battles, overpowered and dispersed the forces that had been loyal to Forkbeard. As a side note, it's contested exactly how much of the Danish kingdom was taken over by Eric. However, by late 992, the powerful Swedish monarch managed to at least conquer a meaningful portion of Denmark, if not all. Though a more modern interpretation of this has King Eric holding leadership over a confederation of some of the more powerful Danish regional leaders. Nonetheless, this was not a great position for King Forkbeard to be in, far off in a foreign land, definitively not in control of his homeland. So you might be asking the question, he did have an army with him, right? Why didn't he just go back now? And yes, he did have an army with him, but it was smaller in size and ideal for raiding, not nearly enough for attempting to fight off Eric's forces. Going back now would have been a death sentence. Forkbeard quickly realized if he was to regain his kingdom, he was going to need more, more money, more riches to buy the loyalty of any allies that had fallen in with Eric, and also to procure mercenaries to fight on his behalf. On the bright side for Forkbeard, although certainly not for the poor English inhabitants, he was in the ideal spot to soak up the riches required and continued to stay the course in England over the next couple of years, in the aim of building up his bankroll while lining up potential allies for when the time came to make the attempt on regaining Denmark. While savaging up and down the English coastlines over the next couple of years, in order to speed things up, in 994, Forkbeard decided to team up with another, a famous and skilled Norwegian warrior by the name of Olaf Tryggvason, who was in the area as well, establishing not a friendship per se, more like a working arrangement or an alliance of convenience, mutually beneficial to help them secure riches for their respective future plans, which interestingly, in only a short time from then, would put them in deep conflict against one another. For now though, with their combined strength, fleet and soldiers, this enabled them to hatch a more ambitious plan. After spending the early months of 994 burning and ravaging along the coasts of modern-day Kent and Essex in southeastern England, Forkbeard and Olaf decided to boldly go after some bigger fish, sailing up the Thames River and began besieging the city of London. Unable to break the stranglehold that these two Viking co-leaders had over the city, King Æthelred opted for another tactic. 
Dangeld, and began negotiations on what it would cost for Forkbeard and Olaf to end their attack and return to their lands. In addition to all the plunder they had picked up leading to this point, this was most certainly the cherry on top. 16,000 pounds of silver, a massive hoard of riches for the time. Both Svein Forkbeard and Olaf Tryggvason found themselves fabulously rich, readily able to finance any endeavors that their hearts desired. So after feasting and drinking to their recent successes, they parted ways, Olaf gathering his forces and ships and sailing off eastwards across the North Sea. Whereas Forkbeard remained in the area of the British Isles, because he couldn't exactly go back to Denmark until he had lined up more troops to his cause and figured out the path to retake his kingdom from Eric the Victorious. For Olaf, although we'll never know what he told Forkbeard his future plans would be when they parted ways, he was in fact making his way to Norway to conquer it for himself. Although he would have definitely been aware that his raiding compatriot also had designs on those lands as well. Of note is that part of the peace treaty wherein Danegeld was paid out, Olaf Tryggvason was also baptized in the Christian faith, and readily took to his new religion, especially since he believed it to be a key factor in his future successes. As you may recall from episode 8, when we last left the situation in Norway, Hakon Sigurdsson had firmly established himself as the reigning king in Norway, in everything but name, after his stunning defeat of the Joms Vikings at the Battle of Hjorngaver in 986. With his power fully unchecked in Norway, Hakon increasingly began to rule in an authoritative and oppressive manner over his Norwegian subjects, in part due to his frustration and inability to be named king. You see, despite the importance of military prowess in Viking culture, bloodlines, in particular royal bloodlines, were still an important feature of kingship legitimacy. And not any chieftain, however talented, could present himself as king to be. Unlike Hakon, Olaf Tryggvason possessed the appropriate royal ancestry, being the great grandson of Harald Fairhair, the first king of Norway which would have legitimized his right to rule, further bolstered by his fame and power as a celebrated Viking leader. When Olaf landed in Norway at the head of an army behind him, he was expecting a tough fight. Surprisingly, what he instead found was that Hakon's increasingly unhinged rule and Olaf's lineage and linkage to Norway resulted in the populace flocking to his banner, and he was able to assume control of Norway with relative ease. In fact, he didn't even need to kill or capture Hakon himself, this having been taken care of by someone within Hakon's ranks. By 995, things were not looking great for Forkbeard, particularly with all the recent events landing him in a desperate situation. When, roughly only nine years ago, he had replaced his father to assume the throne of arguably the most powerful of Viking nations, and destined for greatness. Well, that notion certainly unraveled quickly, and with Denmark at risk of being permanently overrun with King Eric of Sweden occupying his lands, and Norway even further out of reach in the hands of Olaf Tryggvason, a capable commander who had even a better claim to the Norwegian throne than he did. Lastly, it appeared more unlikely than ever that he would ever be able to capture the English throne. The funny thing is, Desperate situations have an interesting way of unveiling the true character of a person, forcing them to strategize, and when required, quickly jump onto opportunities more tenaciously than they ever did before. But you need some luck as well. Plus, it definitely doesn't hurt if you also have longships parked somewhere and loaded with untold riches. In the top end of this episode, I mentioned the importance of luck. And what would unfold now was the first of two key instances of fortune turning in Forkbeard's favor, that he would seize upon voraciously and fuel his meteoric resurgence. First, a turn of fortune for Forkbeard in Denmark, saving him the trouble of fighting Eric the Victorious to regain his crown. The 50-year-old Swedish monarch suddenly died, with no clear account of how this transpired 
whether from natural causes or from something else like injuries sustained in battle to expand his kingdom, triggering Forkbeard to immediately swoop in and quickly make his way back to Denmark, taking it with ease. Eric had been the glue of the alliance that had overtaken the Danish kingdom, and no one remaining possessed the appropriate ancestry or royal bloodlines to keep it together. Almost overnight, Forkbeard went from being an exile back to the King of Denmark, and now one of the richest Viking leaders due to his recent years of raiding. And he didn't even have to use a penny of it to retake his kingdom. He then augmented his enviable position with another power move of a different sort, a political calculation that would in time pay huge dividends. As a result of Eric's death, Denmark wasn't the only prize to be won. Forkbeard also had his eyes on Eric's widow, Queen Sigrid of Sweden, the influential mother of Eric's successor, now King Olaf, also known as Sigrid the Haughty. Now, just a quick clarification here. She wasn't the haughty in the sense that she was good-looking, although reportedly beautiful. Haughty meaning impetuous, bordering on arrogant a powerful and intelligent ruler in her own right, spotted with a wrathful streak when necessary. A notion further demonstrated, at least as legend puts it, when beset by suitors on all sides, she had two that she deemed as unworthy burned to death, only willing to entertain the advances of the most powerful Viking leaders. And Forkbeard wasn't the only powerful Scandinavian monarch looking to gain her hand along with the substantial political benefits that came along with it. Like Olaf Tryggvason did in taking Norway, he also got to Sigrid first, wisely understanding this to be a key piece of the puzzle in his aim of becoming the most powerful ruler in Scandinavia. He was now the king of Norway and famous for being a strong warrior, a worthy future husband by Sigrid's estimation, and almost succeeded but then he made a terrible blunder. Just as everything appeared set for this union to occur, thus uniting Norway and Sweden through marriage, Olaf's steadfast dedication to Christianity weaved its way into this negotiation. Olaf demanded, as an indispensable condition, that Sigrid should be baptized, to which she strenuously objected as an ardent believer in the Norse gods, their last encounter ending in disaster. Dismayed and enraged at her defiance, the Norwegian king struck her face with his glove, roaring, What do I want with thee, thou old heathen jade? Holding a mask of cold composure, Sigrid rose from her chair and calmly left the room, at the door only stopping to respond, That shall be thy death. Not surprisingly, with that strike, the potential for the marriage dissolved into nothingness, and Olaf's conduct there sealed his fate. Now, had Olaf Tryggvason actually married Sigrid, I am convinced that this union would have seriously hampered Forkbeard's future achievements right then and there. But of course, these events transpired down a different path. Learning of the prospect of marriage between Olaf Tryggvason and Sigrid ending in shambles, this marked the second key turn of fortune for Forkbeard, who must have sighed in relief about how this ended up. And immediately after learning of these events, although he was already married to Gunhild, jumped into the arena, reaching out to Sigrid, making a case for their marriage. In turn, Sigrid acknowledged the potential potency of this marriage, being that Forkbeard fit the bill of what she considered to be a suitable partner. A famous, feared warrior and military commander and securely back in his throne in Denmark, and insanely rich due to his recent raiding in England, an overall powerful leader in essentially every respect. Although part of her motivation for agreeing to this had to have been the terrible wrath of retribution aimed at Olaf, being that Forkbeard, as a rival to Olaf Tryggvason for control over Norway, would have made it known to her that part of his intention or future plans was to wage war to regain the country. And while baptized in the Christian faith himself, wisely, Forkbeard had no issues at all with her not following suit. 
Not to mention that he wasn't exactly a devoted Christian himself. With all the terms met of these negotiations and Sigrid nodding her head in agreement, Forkbeard divorced his first wife Gunhild and sent her packing, and in late 995 was married with Sigrid of Sweden, uniting the Swedish and Danish royal families, but not the crowns. Those would remain independent from one another, with the reigning king of Sweden agreeing not to encroach on Danish lands, and Forkbeard agreeing not to invade Sweden in reprisal of Eric's previous takeover. Certainly a crafty bit of maneuvering on Sigrid's part, thereby preserving her son's status and avoiding Forkbeard's wrath. This political marriage did a lot to strengthen Forkbeard's position as well. Not only did Forkbeard no longer have to worry about Sweden again coming in to threaten his kingdom, the union would also prove to be the foundation of a powerful alliance that in time would allow Forkbeard to become the dominant Viking king in all of Scandinavia. As for Olaf Tryggvason, he saw the writing on the wall and understood what was happening here too and what this meant for him and began rattling his sword along with working to cobble together an alliance to effectively combat his former partner in crime knowing all too well that this Danish king would soon be coming for him. His position now further galvanized through this strategic marriage to Sigrid and a newly established alliance with the Swedish kingdom. From 996 over the next couple of years, Forkbeard was able to focus his efforts on two central agenda items. First, learning the lessons from his previous missteps concentrating on solidifying his hold on the Danish throne by cleaning house, including going after and mopping up the internal factions that had previously supported the takeover of his kingdom, and reversing the policy that Eric the Victorious had enabled when he reopened the borders to the German Christian clergy, by throwing them out and continuing to replace them with missionaries of Danish ancestry in the effort to preserve his nation's sovereignty while alleviating the strain of conversion, as he did back when he commenced his reign. As a side note, it seems that another stroke of fortune was that being preoccupied with these types of actions and acting as a thorn in Denmark's side was no longer among the Holy Roman Empire's priorities, being that they had problems of their own to keep them busy mired in an intense internal power struggle at the time. Forkbeard's other main undertaking involved making extensive preparations for the retaking of Norway, augmenting his alliance with King Olaf of Sweden by including Eric Hackenson, the son of Forkbeard's deceased rebellious Norwegian vassal, who was keen on avenging the death of his father, which he attributed to Olaf Tryggvason's invasion of Norway. By September in the year 1000, everything was in place, with a prime opportunity arising to launch the strike on his adversary. Forkbeard learning of the Norwegian king's whereabouts, away from his stronghold and sailing to Pomerania on a diplomatic mission. Pomerania being the historical region on the southern shore of the Baltic Sea in Central Europe, split between modern-day Poland and Germany. Trygvason had gone there canvassing and meeting with regional German and Polish leaders in an effort to drum up support for the alliance that he was in the midst of building. So, how did Forkbeard know where to find Olaf Trygvason, you may be asking? Well, he had inserted a traitor into Trygvason's ranks. Sigvaldi, leader of the Jomsvikings, who, you may recall from episode 8, led a failed attack on Norway back in 986 in the attempt to take back these lands for Forkbeard. Sigvaldi, in the months leading up to that point, had somehow managed to gain Olaf Tryggvason's confidence, concocting a story to convince him that Forkbeard too was among his enemies. And so Tryggvason welcomed the Jom's Viking captain with open arms understanding the immense value of these devastating warriors in the inevitable clash ahead. Sigvaldi had accompanied the Norwegian king to Pomerania and discreetly sent word to Forkbeard, advising that the time to strike would soon be at hand, while they were en route back to Norway. 
Upon learning this, Forkbeard quickly marshaled his forces and the ships close at hand, calling upon his allies to meet him at the agreed-upon destination. And they were soon lying in wait in their longships, predators hidden from view, stealthily waiting for their prey to pass by. All told, with Forkbeard and his allies totaling approximately 5,000 warriors and about 60 ships, tucked within a cove in an island called Svolder, also known as Svold. Unfortunately, the location of this island and the sea battle is unknown. However, the historical accounts point to two potential locations. Near the island of Rügen, just off the north coast of modern-day Germany, and the location that I think is more likely is the strait between Danish Zealand and Scania, Sweden, today known as Ursund due to a number of reasons, including it being closer to the domains of Forkbeard and his allies, thus quicker to get to, and being that he was situated in Pomerania, this would have also been the fastest route, and more likely the path that Olaf Tryggvason would have taken when sailing back to Norway. And lastly, the waterways of this strait narrow considerably between the adjoining land masses, to only 4 kilometers in width, which would have been the perfect choke point to unleash the ambush, preventing escape into the open sea. In September of 1000, as Olaf Tryggvason and his fleet were making their way back towards Norway, numbering somewhere in the realm of 30 ships or so, the wily Sigvaldi convinced Olaf that he would take up the point position leading the convoy home, alongside the smallest and swiftest of Olaf's fleet, which was a key aspect of the ploy, because he used this as a means to cast confusion as they sailed north en route to Norway, breaking up the convoy and their cohesion, separating them from the larger and slower moving vessels. The bulk of Olaf's fleet, almost 20 ships, took a far lead, passing the island of Svolder where Forkbeard and his allies were hidden and waiting to pounce. And as they sailed on by, seeing nothing amiss, nor perceiving any threats. Although Sigvaldi at some point turned back, advising the accompanying ships to proceed, stating that he would go back to find and connect with the rest of the fleet, which was still making its way through the strait. Eleven ships, the slowest moving, but also the largest and strongest warships, holding approximately 1,500 warriors in total but all of these were dwarfed by the Norwegian king's newly constructed flagship, the legendary Ormen Langja, the English translation of which would be the Long Serpent, containing a large crew of hand-picked men, the best sailors and soldiers that Olaf could find. The Long Serpent was unrivaled in its time, and apparently one of the largest Viking longships ever constructed, about 150 feet in length, including multiple decks and unusually high sidewalls, which would have made assaulting the ship extremely challenging and detrimental, as Forkbeard's forces were about to find out. Reportedly so large that it could hold hundreds of warriors, one account stating 600, although I believe that to be a bit of an overestimation. With the bulk of the Norwegian fleet sailing through the area untouched, once out of view, Forkbeard and his allies rode out of concealment and into the strait to ambush Olaf's fleet, outnumbering them more than three to one. We can only imagine the aerial view of this encounter, known as the Battle of Svolder, like a pack of snarling wolves closing in on a huge bison or moose the Viking warriors on both sides roaring out challenges to their enemies, while others implored the strength of their gods, whether Norse or Christian, to guide them to victory. As sixty smaller longships descended upon the eleven strongest of Olaf's fleet, it was far from a foregone conclusion, given the strength and caliber of the Norwegian ships, most notably the Long Serpent. Tryggvason made no attempt to try sailing out of harm's reach and took up a defensive posture, commanding his men to tie all their ships together side by side, making a floating island of sorts so that his troops wouldn't be isolated with the long serpent in the middle and five other ships on each side of it. 
Forkbeard, followed by King Olaf of Sweden, initiated the attack, making immediately for the center of this impromptu island, the bow and stern of the Long Serpent, where Olaf Tryggvason stood high above everyone else, dressed in red robes that were draped over his heavy armor. The Norwegian king and his men had the great advantage of towering over the attackers and began hurling spears and other weapons down upon them. The Long Serpent had a great depth over the waterline and was extremely difficult to enter from ordinary ships. Yet, despite suffering big losses in the attack, under a hail of arrows and spears being thrown into their ranks, Forkbeard and King Olaf of Sweden bravely continued pressing their attacks in order to keep the Norwegian forces occupied on all sides of the impromptu island, but also allowing two pincer assaults, led by Eric Hackinson, to chip away at the boats and the warriors to the side of the flagship, methodically clearing each deck one by one. As illustrated in the saga of Olaf Tryggvason, thereon came up from all sides, Danes and Swedes into battle over against the ships of King Olaf. The battle was very fierce, and men fell thick and fast. And so at the end befell it, that all the ships that pertained unto King Olaf were cleared, save and except the Long Serpent. While the initial assault had been costly in terms of casualties to Forkbeard and his men, the tide had soon turned under their superior number, decimating the warriors under Tryggvason. And hours into this bloody, seagoing affair, the brutal fight was nearing its end, with the Norwegian king and only a handful of his men left on the Long Serpent, being assailed on from all sides. For Tryggvason, understanding that the battle was indeed lost, robes tattered and torn, armor hacked into and wounded, in a last breath effort, he ran to the edge of his great ship and dove over into the sea, fully armored, disappearing into the depths, unwilling to be taken prisoner or killed by another hand. And with that, Norway was now in the hands of Forkbeard and his allies. In the days that followed, Forkbeard, at the head of his powerful alliance, landed in Norway as conquerors, wherein they began carving up parcels of the nation between them, with the region of Viken regained and back under the Danish kingdom, and Forkbeard reasserting himself as the king of Norway. Interestingly, he found that in doing so, the populace was rather amendable to their new rulers, being that unlike Tryggvason, they were not Christian hardliners and extremely tolerant of whichever beliefs the people align themselves with. In a much broader sense, this victory also introduced a period of relative peace and stability over much of the Nordic lands, with Forkbeard and his allies firmly in charge and no viable challengers of substance on the horizon, coinciding with a time during which Forkbeard himself would have been regarded as the dominant king in all of Scandinavia and its waterways. What an unbelievable turn of events from only five short years ago, when he had been on the utter edge of losing absolutely everything while he was abroad in England. It's hard to discount the notion that he got some lucky breaks, which ultimately allowed him to climb out of the hole that he was in. However, in the same breath, those lucky breaks would have been nothing in themselves had he not pounced on them with tenacity inserting a masterful strategic lens in order to exploit these opportunities to achieve so much in such a short amount of time, resulting in Denmark now solidly in his unquestioned grasp, coupled with the overarching peace unfolding between the Nordic nations and the fact that the Holy Roman Empire had internal problems that Otto III was looking to resolve, thus not concerned with its neighbors. These factors cleared the way for Forkbeard to look beyond his immediate borders and begin on the path of planning out how he would begin fulfilling his coronation vow of conquering England, killing or deposing its weak king, a king who would rather pay than fight, accordingly, by a Viking estimation, not deserving of his crown. From that perspective, raiding was one thing and relatively straightforward, 
but conquering and trying to hang onto the crown in these lands was entirely something else, requiring a comprehensive and strategic approach. But before Forkbeard had a chance to figure out exactly what this would look like, a cataclysm of epic proportions was about to crash upon the Scandinavian settlers of England in 1002, also marking the beginning of the end for the reigning English monarch, Æthelred the Unready. An event of infamy called the St. Bryce's Day Massacre that would deeply motivate a more immediate yet feral response from the dominant Scandinavian king, driven by something much deeper than the glint of silver coins. In the next episode, we're going to backtrack in the chronology a little bit, focusing on England to get a better picture of how things led up to the point of a horrific massacre of thousands of ancestral Scandinavians ordered by King Æthelred, before delving into Forkbeard's immediate response in 1003, once again crossing the North Sea to English shores, laying waste to every town and city that he came across but that under the surface would allow him to begin formulating how he would go about taking over this nation, requiring a masterful long-term strategy, heavily draining English resources through a 10-year campaign of almost constant harassment, culminating with a full-scale invasion in 1013, doing something that no other Nordic warrior had dreamed of until that point, becoming the first Viking king of England. A short-lived achievement in itself, but with a royal legacy and lineage that persists to this day. This and more to come in the next episode of the Warlords of History podcast. If you want to support the podcast, there's a number of things you can do. You can tell your family and friends about the show. Please rate, review, and subscribe on whichever platform you happen to access the show on. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. And lastly, you can take a look at the show's website, warlordsofhistory.com, where I'll include some additional info, like images and maps pertaining to this episode for your viewing pleasure. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the episode. Theme music from audionautics.com 